talking about uh, some color gradients in vector graphics and how to use them to uh, create almost photorealistic illustrations. Uh, before I start with that, I thought it would be nice to um, well, tell some more personal stuff first. How I started with Inkscape. Uh, that was about 10 years ago. I was working on a project in my bachelor, I think, and then my supervisor said, hey, why don't you use LaTeX and Inkscape for your report? And I found out how Inkscape works, more or less, and later on I discovered that hey, you can make extensions and write them in Python. And, uh, I started with, uh, or trying to modify one, and in my case that was the Lindemeyer uh, or L system extension, as you see here. I was trying to create this tree, which is known as the uh, Pythagoras tree, but I couldn't really figure out how to do it, um, because people that might know the L system extension might not know this box here in the bottom, you need some kind of scaling factor to get this right. And well, on the Inkscape form, I just checked and the topic is actually still up. It's from 2010. So here you see me fumbling and trying to figure out how to make it work. And well, in the end, it kind of worked and um, some more stuff. And, um, so finally, I, I got this and I thought, ah, let's extend it a little bit more. and. Um, also tweak the edge width and maybe the colors of the, of the leaves of the tree and eventually get something like this. So you get just one big command in your L system plugin and uh, it renders this. I thought, ah, that's nice and uh, that was 10 years ago. <laughs> and nowadays I'm still working a little bit on, on extensions. Uh, but mostly I'm using Inkscape now for uh, laser cutting and laser engraving. I included a couple of examples. Uh, so this is some engraving on, on slate and engraving on wood with a little bit of crochet on my side as well. <laughs> uh, something completely different and this also serves as a warning or a disclaimer that some of the slides later on might be a bit more mathematically involved. <laughs> European <laughs> warning. Um, and some other stuff, um, cutting and maybe something more artistic, something more useful as this plant stand. And there's a lot of other stuff. Um, actually, most of the stuff in my house is now laser cut and laser engraved. <laughs> I started on the pillows to laser engrave them, and that was too much for my girlfriend. Um, so that's how I use Inkscape in spare time, and now for research. Ah, I almost forgot about this one. I just made this one for the before the conference. So I put them with me. If you want to have a look at them later, they're right here. Okay, so now from hobby to research. Um, it was some time ago that I found out that there is uh, something called a gradient mesh in Inkscape, and I thought that it would be an interesting topic as part of my PhD to um, well, help improve that. Not in Inkscape at the moment, but more like a standalone uh, context for now. And color gradients in vector graphics, well, you probably know the linear and the radial gradients. Then there is the gradient mesh, which was introduced more or less 20 years ago by Adobe. Uh, Coral Draw followed up quickly, and Inkscape now also has it. And this bell pepper is one of the well, common examples to explain the gradient mesh, which I'll do a bit later on. Um, and by the way, the stem of this pepper is not the gradient mesh, it's just a lot of linear color gradients stacked on top of each other. So gradient meshes are one of the ways to do um, color gradients in vector graphics. Then about 10 years later, an alternative was proposed, uh, the fusion curves, which work in a well, fundamentally different way. Although also both methods have their uh, intersections, let's say. So both methods are heavily based on, on curves. So here clearly the fusion curves is based on curves, but also your, your color gradients, uh, they are basically curved networks that you assign colors to. So curves, well, that brings us to Bezier curves. Out of curiosity, who does not know how a Bezier curve works? <laughs> well, basically this, these are uh, cubic Bezier curves, and what you see is that the black points are interpolated, the white points act as handles, and they pull the curve towards them. Um, I like to call them tangent handles, because the curve is tangent to those handles, as you might observe. Um, so you can do quite a lot of shapes with a single curve, but of course if you want to do something more serious, you want to connect them. Um, usually you want to connect them in a more 
or more or less smooth way. So that happens if you have your one pair, you want to connect something smooth to the first one. You create or extend the sound on the bottom so that it's put in here on the same line with the other two. You add some random other point and handle and then the second curve that is defined by that is uh, tangent continuous with the first one or G1 continuous and you can well, extend this curve in this, uh, this fashion as much as you, as, as you like <coughs> so that is the geometry so remember the gradient mesh you have this mesh of, of, of curves so basically all these curves are these connected or can be interpreted as these connected Bezier curves then what about the color? So the color lives on top of these curves and eventually also in the interior of the mesh. So what you can think of is that you have a separate red, a green, a blue, maybe even an alpha channel uh, as a height field on top of your mesh. So if you look at one of those curves and only consider the, the red color field for this moment, you might have something like this. You have a couple of control points and you have assigned these colors to them in the red channel and now you want to interpolate them somehow. One way to do this is just linear interpolation. It's straightforward, it's okay. Uh, but you can do much better, right? You can do some cubic interpolation. Uh, and actually, this is very similar to what uh, Ralph presented on Friday. Uh, you have some uh, degrees of freedom how to interpolate this. So this is a cubic interpolation of the color. It's monotonic, which means that um, it either goes, how to say, the red value increases in a monotonic fashion or decreases. There is no, no <coughs> wiggles that go up and down too much. Um, but this still doesn't look that nice. So there are alternatives, something like this. And that uh, facilitates you with well, color interpolation on your curves. Now you take all your curves, you assemble your curve network, um, and that's basically the starting position of your gradient mesh. Something else that you might want to um, think about is which color space do you want to interpolate in, right? Usually that's probably sRGB, <coughs> but as we heard in a very nice uh, talk from yesterday from Faya uh, well, there are a lot of other color spaces that might be more intuitive to work with in certain contexts. For now, I just focused on sRGB, but keep in mind that eventually you might want to uh, uh, choose a different space. So to, to, to recap, creative matches at the control points, you have your colors that you can assign to them, and the handles, you actually cannot do this manually, but this gets updated automatically. So then you have your cell in your mesh, the interpolation of the color um, also then happens automatically based on those 12 points on the boundary. Um, in a mathematical term, it's called transfinite interpolation, and this leads to certain uh, surface patches. Then, just to maybe convince you again, or no, convince you about linear versus cubic, um, remember we had the line with the linear color interpolation and the cubic color interpolation. If you now apply this um, in the studio setting, we have the same control mesh on the left and on the right. On the left, we get this linear interpolation, which is not that great. I mean, you get this kind of cross look that is not so nice to, to, to the eye. And the cubic is much nicer. Um, I'm actually banding the color on purpose here to see, or uh, they use the continuity of the color. So where you see kind of sharp transitions, the color is, well, only linear. Um, type or Time for an example. If you now just combine lots of these mesh parts and you have a lot of time and talent, you get something like this. This was not made, made by me. Uh, <laughs> um, and even though the result on the right hand side is nice, the left side is not that nice, I would say. <laughs> Can anyone see or say or tell me what is or what could be improved on the left hand side? There are a couple of things. Any ideas? Oh, I can't do one thing. 
Yeah, okay, so, so on the left is only the geometry and then the colors are assigned to the, to, to the points and then the rendering or the result is just the right hand side. <coughs> um, one of the things that are not so nice about this mesh on the left is that you have a lot of density here. Um, you might locally need some detail here, but the graded mesh it wants to keep this structured grid uh, loop. So what happens is that if you have your graded mesh and you want to have some local detail, you click and you have an entire new line or column of points that is inserted. You only want maybe two or three points locally, but the points are inserted all the way through the mesh. And that very quickly clutters up the mesh, right? Because if you want to tweak this now, it's a nightmare. Um, so that is something that could be improved, not global refinement, but only local refinement. Um, also gradient meshes, for those who have worked with them, they are uh, rectangular in nature, right? You can deform it, but still it is rectangular. And a lot of shapes are simply not rectangular. Uh, so rectangular is not the optimal shape for a lot of uh, objects to model on. So the first thing I worked on is that instead of this global refinement, so let's say this line was not here before, we want a point here, and that results in all these points being inserted. So instead of global, I thought oh, local refinement would be much more effective. Um, I mean, it requires a bit of a more complicated uh, data structure to work with, but in the end, you only get the points that you really want to work with. Then the topology, so that means the connectivity of your mesh, you want to, um, or ideally would like to have this uh, more flexible, right? So instead of just rectangular, have some uh, well, space to, to change this a bit. And finally, um, sharp transitions in color are not very easy in the traditional graded mesh. You basically need to collapse an entire column or row of, of cells and that results in um, well, a sharp color transition, but it's not a very elegant way to do it. So I worked on uh, these three things and I will demo this shortly. So, again, this is not an Inkscape, but the, all, the, all the improvements could be actually added to Inkscape. Not yet. <laughs> not yet, that is the right way to say it, yeah. Think <laughs> about Press it again. Mm -hmm. So we have a very basic graded mesh here, and what we can now do is we can refine it only locally. So we get a point here, which we can assign some random color to. And here, the line stops here, it's only local, so we can just uh, add another point or do something like here. Right, you only get points where they are needed, you don't get this completely cluttered workspace. Um, then for connectivity or topology, um, if you want you can extend some part of the mesh. For now this is very basic, but you can just <coughs> extrude it a little bit and well, <laughs> play with this a bit. Um, and then also for the sharp color transition, so I'll take an actual example. Um, it would take too long to demo. Um, so here you also see local refinement, you see some extension of, of, of the mesh. And if you zoom in on the control points, you see that some of them have multiple colors assigned to them, which result in your sharp color transition. So using only a very coarse mesh, which is a few number of points, you are getting more or less close to something that looks towards photorealistic. Um, one of the challenges with this was that um, local refinement introduces these T sections in your mesh, right? And then if you want to display this or render it, um, that complicates things a little bit because if you don't use this or don't render this in a pixel, pixel accurate way, you basically rely on your triangles that might come from OpenGL or whatever other environment. So if you take a look at the triangulation that is happening on the need, um, you see that we have to, well, <laughs> do certain things to make sure that a left and a right side of your patch uh, matches up with the triangulation. What I mean by that is that here we have a big patch, and here we have two of them, and they share a curve. Um, each patch individually has its own triangulation, but of course here at the T point, the triangulation has to, uh, has to match up. If it does not, you will get cracks in your mesh. That 
would look something like this with my face. There should be some drugs appearing now, but no. yeah, ah, there was one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is not what you want. So, drag free, and it's drag free. Although there's not an artifact here, but okay. <laughs> <coughs> so, that is pretty much uh, what I did with graded meshes. It's still based on uh, bicubic meshes, so cubic interpolation in both directions. So this could be added to, to, to Inkscape at some point. These are some more examples. So these are first the, the, the meshes with the color points on them. And then if you render them, you get something like this. And again, if you look at the um, control net, it's only a few points, but it allows you to, to model things up. Look hopefully nice. So gradient meshes, there's still quite a bit of other research that can be done. Um, one of my colleagues is working on noisy gradient meshes. It allows you to add um, local detail without having to add points. You can, I think one of his examples is you have a banana and you have these kind of brownish black spots on the banana and they get added not through control, not through control points, but as uh, some kind of noise. So some purling noise or something like that, which is then user control. Um, other interesting directions are merging patches. So if you took the example mesh from uh, the actress, there's a lot of density there. Maybe you can reverse it and actually merge some of those patches that makes it uh, easier to work with. Um, yeah, there's a whole other, or whole list of other topics that could be worked on. Uh, factorization is used for quite a lot nowadays, so that means the automatic um, generation from a raster image to a graded mesh. So you just take a picture of something, uh, you feed it to some smart program in it, factorizes it into, into a gradient mesh. But still, all those methods use these uh, traditional gradient meshes, so no local requirements and all this. And finally, it would be very nice to have this in, in SVG2, point X. Um, so if anyone who is affiliated with web browsers is listening or watching the video later, it would be very nice to um, keep working on this, keep pushing this. So that was the graded mesh part. Um, the second part is on the fusion curves. It will be very short because I only started working with this uh, a couple of months ago. It is a process that is much more um, artistic, I would say, because you start with the outline of your object. You don't have to fiddle around, fiddle around with a mesh, but just you start with your outlines. You assign colors to your curves that can be different on both sides. And then by um, some diffusion process, the color diffuses to the interior of your mesh. Or of your object. Um, traditionally, this is done by solving a partial differential equation, it's just a mathematical model of uh, diffusion. There are a lot of different methods how you could uh, approach that, and lately, this one has come up: ray tracing, which doesn't really solve this this PDE, but it uses a different approach that results in something that looks very much the same. And the nice thing about ray tracing is that we can easily uh, parallelize this on the GPU. Okay. This is a super basic interface for now. We have four BJ curves here with some uh, colors assigned to them. Then we sample some points on each curve. We use those points to have or to create a triangulation. So it's a constraint belonging triangulation that you create. This is this thing. So we have uh, some density close to the, to the curves and elsewhere you have bigger triangles. And then for every point in a triangulation, you shoot around some rays, you intersect the curves, and you average the color value, and you get something that looks like this. Um, and you can move things around, oh, let me disable the triangulation. You can move things around and intersect things, and, oh, uh, <laughs> and well, if you will have more time, add more curves in a more reasonable way, you can Hopefully you see that it would also be a nice way to uh, well, create nicely looking vector images. Um, you might be aware that uh, Adobe, I think it was last year, introduced this freeform gradient that is more or less based on, on, on this, or maybe the other way around. <laughs> um, yeah, the diffusion curves were introduced about 10 years ago. 
originally it was that you assign color to the curves like this way. Later on people thought, hey, that's not very intuitive. Let's just use those curves as a boundary. And then in the inside of those curves have color curves or points that act as a color source. So then the color assigned to those points and the curves kind of radiates out from those sources and builds your, your image. But the idea is still the same, right? You have some curves, you have triangulation, and you use ray tracing to, um, to get to the result. So that is it for the fusion curves. Also there, there are a couple of um, things to work with. It is used for factorization, though not a lot at this moment. It's a very interesting topic. And the thing that you have to use ray tracing or some other software might make it a bit more difficult to um, incorporate it somehow in SVG because then probably also the solver should be uniform. I mean, you can imagine if someone else if someone uses solver A and solver B, the result might be similar but not identical. Well, that is not very desired. Um, so, with that, I would like to uh, conclude. Thank you for your attention. Last presentation. And